here. Hi everyone, it's been a while. Welcome back. Uh, we have not disappeared. We are here. We have been here. And we always going to be here. Um, so a lot of things have changed. It's for the better, I would say. We have grown consciously and personally and um, I guess so from the from the inspirational perspective, I would say this has been a journey of the awakening, reawakening to, I guess, the greater realities of who we truly are, remembering um, who we truly are. Um, it's it's not been easy because growth is never easy. If any tell me growth is easy talk to somebody else not interested but anyway so it's um, but I really say it's we should be all focusing on raising our frequency raising our consciousness working on ourselves helping um, dissolve and release some of those old patterns old programs that are uh, lingering within us. So it's it's ultimately always we have to choose love. So it's easy said than done. But guess what? If I'm if I'm faced, for example, with something that's challenging, that's confrontational, that's difficult, I would say I'm stating. I choose love now. What that's doing, it's really transforming my energy consciously. So I'm taking ownership of my own energy and I'm stating, taking the ownership, that I'm choosing the energy of love. And we have to uh, recommend that everyone chooses that because that helps us to to live together, to coexist together, because we have to. We have to find a ways to coexist. There is, we, are, we are one family, one family of, of human beings, of the species, of this creation. The universe is immense, beyond our comprehension. There are, there are, there are species that we can even, we can even imagine they will, they will probably be so scary that it will be above, it's above our comprehension. But as a human beings, we have to start with ourselves. And this is the great, um, I would say, test and opportunity for us to make the choice. Choose love. Always. State it out. Affirm it. I choose love. You can't go wrong with that. And watch it. Observe it. What happens with the energy? Because we radiate energy. Once we radiate the energy, it's not only we are changing ourselves, but we are changing the energy that everyone is around us is, is being affected by the energy. So that's my kind of... Uh, a um, few words, I want to say it. Uh, this is... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, be strong. Follow your heart. Yes, we are, we, we are supposed to be here. No, follow your heart. Go that 18 inches. Mm. I always remember, always, please, say, hey, Ross, make a different choice. Go 18 inches down. Because we are here. We are here. I'm here. <coughs> no. In your heart. Once you go in the heart, you can, you can feel. Feel the energy. Feel the, the surroundings of your family member, of your friend, of your neighbor. It's, it's different. It's totally different. It changes. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're in that space, but we have to make a choice. It's not what's going to do for us. No one's going to... We have, to, we have to take the ownership of ourselves. No one's going to do it for us. I'm sorry. That's, that's the hard, 
hard reality. We have to do it for ourselves because we are sovereign. We are sovereign as a human beings, as a species. We don't understand it yet, fully comprehend. But yes, we are sovereign. And we are more powerful than we can ever imagine. It's not joke. It's reality that we've been dumbed down by the environment, by the culture, by the society, etc., etc. No, we are. We are powerful. Our soul is infinite. We are infinite. So let's take that ownership. Please. So that's all. That's all I want to say here. Um, so as a Boulder Exo, we have changed a little bit. We are evolving. It's, um, it's the team have changed. Uh, we are just myself, Ross, Ross Locklear. We have Cynthia, Cynthia Marsh and Julia Steiner. That's who you're looking at it. That's Boulder Exo 2.0 uh, currently. That's how it is. Uh, we have our own passions. Our own, as you can see, my passion is consciousness, awareness, frequency, and, and growing people. Um, Cynthia, you have some stuff up front, right? Uh, Cynthia is a wonderful uh, artist. She, she draws things. They are very inspirational. But what does it mean inspirational? That the, the art is it's a sacred geometry, which is just one of the means of, of helping us raise our frequency. So it is. Just another mean. So we are all doing our part in whatever fashion or mm -hmm. color or whatever it is. Uh, Julia, I don't know what uh, you. Uh, Julia I, loves I Course in Miracles. I would, I would Course She's in miracles. an expert in Course in Miracles, <laughs> for example. Yeah, and I just want to thank everybody for, for, you know, it's really great to build a field when we come together like this and we're listening with one mind. We hear something more than we all hear separately because we're joined. And we and, and to play in this larger sandbox, you know, this larger field of, you know, let's just get off planet for a minute, that's a bigger field than people often play in. So it's it's a it's a it's a way to um, open up uh, to 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 allow the unknown and to play play with that. And it's it's just a fun place I think. I think if you're here on the planet and you're growing and expanding, why not play in the biggest field you can find, you know, here? And consciousness, of course, is the, you know, who we are, our identity is the biggest field we can play in. But if, if we know that we are these beings of love that extend love, then, then the big field is fun to play in. It's not fearful at all. It's completely creative. And I'm so glad we're all playing here to yeah. So thank you for being here, for making the choice to be here. We are we are not going anywhere. We're just restarting it and continuing um, our journey back again it, to connecting people together. It's all about growth. So there will be more information coming out. We have some difficulties with our with our site website. There's been some attack. Looks like on on our site. Some other ones have been too, so there are always those individuals, maybe they are not so of a pure heart, but you know, it's all being worked out. So that's the reality, but we are here. And on that note, Cynthia, please, if you could introduce our wonderful speaker. Okay. Thank you. Ian Jaded, in this presentation, he will discuss his 35 years of direct experiences with lucid dreaming and how the phenomenon is merely the first step in a larger journey into the paranormal states of consciousness and enlightenment. He's the author of Tripping the Field and Migration, the creator of Eboga Moon Productions, as well as the video series Conscious Migration, an exploration of consciousness based on his last book. 
Around the age of 19, Yin began spontaneously lucid dreaming, a unique state of consciousness where the dreamer becomes fully cognizant of the fact that they are dreaming. Anybody else <coughs> ever have that experience here? Okay, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool when it happens. As these experiences grew in frequency and intensity, Ian was eventually forced to wrestle with his understanding of reality, the ego, and the very bounds of awareness. His journeys eventually led to an array of paranormal phenomena, including out-of-body states, energetic healing, and encounters with UFOs. Today he writes and speaks to others about the conclusions he's drawn on everything he's encountered over the years so that others can explore these same realms and hopefully expand upon his research. And now I give you Ian and we will take a break in about an hour. Sure, yeah. Uh, bathroom break and then we'll come back and then we will do a Q&A. So enjoy. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cynthia, where did you find that? It sounds familiar, but somehow that didn't... Where'd you find that one? I think you wrote Did it. I, I, I know I must have written it. <laughs> thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you for dealing with the heat and all of the strangeness that's going on out there today and in general. Uh, and before, yeah, before we get started, uh, Ross kind of inspired me when he, he's talking about uh, consciousness, how we have to stay centered, stay in our hearts, especially with what is going on right now in the world. Uh, I don't need to give you the newscast. I think everybody's aware of what's been happening, and it seems often cartoonishly awful. Every time it seems like I've opened the news lately, it is like, what horrendous thing has happened now? And I was really feeling it. Uh, I, I really had to stop myself about two weeks ago, where I really had to stop and go, what is going on? I'm really taking this on. I'm really feeling the heaviness of all of this. And you know, when it's something personal in your life, it's easy to point to it. When it's something direct that you're dealing with in your life, some kind of relationship at work or in your personal life, it's easier to point that out when you are feeling the heaviness of things that are going on. But when it's just what's happening with the world, it can be a little more vague. It can be a little bit more abstract. And I, I really started feeling that of just everything that's happening, not just in our country, with the illnesses, the mass shootings, and the political upheavals, and the just general insanity. And then you look at the world as a whole, and I really had to start asking, I had to stop and go, each time I feel that I look at the world and it gets a little bit darker, I always have to come back to my center and go, okay, is there a way to live in this world with your eyes open, to really be aware of what's going on, and yet to really keep a smile on your face, to really stay at peace? And the immediate reaction, the immediate intuition that I came back with was an, an absolute undeniable yes, there is a way. Of course, my brain, I have a very large logical brain that gets in my way all the time. Uh, you know, of course, it starts asking, how? How is that possible? How can you look at what's going on? How can you really be aware of what's going on in this world and keep your heart open and keep genuinely at peace and it required me to stop and say, well, there's a couple of things. Number one that I had to remember is that ultimately, on the larger scale of things, none of this is new for us humans, I would say. What we've dealt with on this planet since we climbed out of the trees, there's always been struggle, there's always been strife. There has never been any guarantees, ever. Now we're more aware of it, we've got lightning fast digital communication so we can find out immediately what's happening everywhere right now and so we can take all of that on now in ways that we never did before. So my realization after that was that it takes gratitude. It takes 
you to be able to stop and go, where am I right now? What am I dealing with right now? And right now, I'm in an air-conditioned lecture hall, and I'm not in pain, and I'm not hungry, and my world right now is not on fire, and uh, things are right now okay. That may not be the case tomorrow, or even an hour from now, but right now, when I'm here, if you pay attention to what's going on, and you can be grateful, if you can be grateful for just what you have, if you can just stop and go, right now I have enough. Right now, I'm not dealing with what's happening in other parts of the country where people are suffering, people are in really bad shape. And that, of course, doesn't solve your problem. That doesn't solve any of the world's problems. But if we could all start there, if everyone could start with that enoughness, if you could start with feeling, I don't need more right now. I don't need more power. I don't need more money. I don't need to amass more respect or fame or attention or any of those things. If you can learn to remember to stop and truly feel grateful, uh, that's the key. And, and of course, every time I have one of these kind of, one of those insights that I've always, you know, each time I've come across these, these dark moments, I have the, that same kind of insight. Oh yes, I have to remember to be, you know, gracious. I have to remember to be, uh, to be in gratitude for what I do have in the moment. It sounds like something I've heard uh, in a Hallmark movie or something I've read on a greeting card. And that, to me, I don't know if any of you have come across this, where you have some deep insight, you have some deep realization, and you go, oh my God, I just saw that on some greeting card the other day, and it sounds so trite. It sounds so obvious, and I've heard this a thousand times. And that's, that's part of the trick that the mind plays, because that's the mind going, I want a reason to ignore this. I'm looking for a reason to not really pay attention to the real wisdom there. And that's the trick where sometimes the deepest wisdom is found also, you know, parroted on some sort of 30 minute episode of uh, some, you know, show that you're watching or something on a, yeah, like I said, the Hallmark Channel or something. So. That's what inspired me, Ross. When you mentioned that, I just had to. I came up with that. That, wow. That's uh, yeah. That's what we're all struggling with right now. That's why Boulder Expo hasn't been around in the same form for a while because of world problems, and we're all trying to find a way to deal with it. So, with that said, hi, I'm Ian. <laughs> um, again, thanks for everybody for showing up. Uh, and Ross, let me know if I kind of wander or anything too much away from the microphone. Let me know because I tend to wander, so just kind of pull me back, uh, pull me back on center. And uh, I will try to pay attention to the time. I know we started late. Thank you for your patience again, everybody. So we're talking about dreaming today, and that's theoretically why you're here uh, to talk about some weird stuff. Dreaming is something that I. I would say probably most of us are familiar with. Cynthia asked a lot of you, how many of you know what a lucid dream is? Who are confident that you know what a lucid dream is? That's great. So that's what I wanted. This is why smaller audiences are actually great, so I can get a little bit of an idea of what we're really talking about or where we're all at. So we're going to be talking about lucid dreaming. And lucid dreaming is something that neurologists and psychologists up until fairly recently for the most part scoffed at because in a lucid dream that is a word that's tossed around a lot a lot of people will say oh yeah but I had a lucid dream and that they're thinking that we're referring to a dream that was very vivid that's not what a lucid dream is or they're thinking that well the dream was very intense and it and it seemed really real that can be some of the characteristics of a lucid dream, but that's still not what a lucid dream is. A lucid dream is when, at some point, during the course of the play of the dream, and you can think about whatever dream you've had most recently, whatever story was playing out, at some point, during the play of the dream, you stop consciously, and you realize fully, oh, None of this is real. 
None of this is actually happening. This is a dream. You see it exactly for what it is. Um, this is something that happens with all of us, but it happens later for the most part, right? This happens after you've woken up, after you've already gotten out of bed. You go, well, that was weird. How crazy was that? Well, it was just a, it was just a vision. It was just a dream. It wasn't terribly important. So this is something I was pulled into about 30 years ago. And I'm going to tell you some stories about how, this, how this, these experiences with lucid dreaming started. And I want to explain why this is important. Why is it important to every person? Even if you never even end up having a lucid dream in your life, although that's going to give you some clues, we're going to talk about some of this to hopefully get some of you into a state of mind where you do have these experiences. That's the idea. But ultimately, this conversation is not really about dreaming. It's about waking up. By that I mean that what I hope to impart, if I don't impart anything else to you tonight, is that the mechanics that keep you asleep in a normal dream state, those mechanics where when you are in a normal dream state, and think of the craziest one you've had. You were a secret agent on Mars trying to uncover alien technology buried deep below the surface. You're trying to figure out what's going on. Somehow during the play of that dream, you never stopped and went, well, this is insane. None of this makes sense at all. That's not what's going on. That's not my story. That's not my life. The same mechanics that keep you asleep to the dream are the same mechanics that keep you asleep to the narratives that are binding you in your daily life. So we're going to talk about that as well. So I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you how this all started for me. And uh, we're going to go from there. But uh, afterwards, uh, I do want to get some question and answers. So I'm going to try to leave enough space for that as well. So uh, think about if you've got anything that specifically you wanted to discuss with me or uh, any questions, that something that didn't make sense along the way. Uh, sounds like a lot of you are not, we're not real familiar with the concept of lucid dreaming. That's okay. So let's get into it. Let's start at the beginning. Um, I'm about 50 years old at this point. This started when I was about 19. I was just out of high school. I'll give you a bit of background. I did not grow up in a particular religious family on any level. Uh, at this point, I was a fairly good kid in school, I was in band, I was the artist. You're seeing my art right now, just kind of through the last 20 years right now. Uh, a lot of, some of it's digital art, a lot of it's mostly, of it's, mostly it's canvas space is what you're seeing. Uh, but I was, not, I was not into drugs at this point, that means anything. I really was never a drinker. I had maybe smoked a bit of pot here and there by that point, but I was living outside of the suburbs of Chicago, and there just wasn't, there was more hard stuff around there that I had, didn't want anything to do with, so. Uh, my first experience was, was really blowing me out of the water because I had never had a consciousness-altering experience at this point, except for maybe, you know, being drunk a couple of times or something like that, which hardly qualifies as a consciousness shifting activity, but that's drinking and still will change your consciousness. So the first time I had a lucid dream, what happened was I had to wake up early to take my mother to work. I wanted the car that day. And this is actually important, believe it or not. So I came back home. Uh, somewhere around 6 in the morning or so, dropping her off at the train station. She worked downtown in Chicago. And then I went back to bed. I was a teenager. You know, I'd sleep all day if I could. That's turned out that, that I had just primed myself for a lucid dream, and I had no idea why. I had primed myself by, first of all, pulling myself out of the deep, deep sleep that I had been in. I had to wake up, and I had to drive across town, get my mother somewhere, and I came back. I went back to bed, right? So my body's still tired. I'm still a growing boy. And, but my mind, I just had to drive across town and back. So my mind is still awake. Body's tired, mind's awake, okay? 
So I go back to sleep, and within moments, I, am, I find myself in a forest. And something was odd about this. This was not a normal dream state. I couldn't quite put a finger on what was going on, but I'm looking around and I'm saying, the sun is out, I can feel the sun on my face. I can smell the earth and the moss beneath my feet. I could put my hand on the trees around me, touch the leaves around me, and they were, I could feel the bark, I could feel the, the cool dampness on the leaves. More real than anything I had ever experienced in my daily life. What does that mean? I don't know. I can't explain that. There's no way I can convey what that actually means to anyone. But all I can say is that somehow this experience was more real than anything else. With anything else I'd ever experienced at all. But that wasn't the thing about this experience at first that was really making it particularly strange. I was imbued with this sort of a euphoria. I felt incredible. I felt uh, higher than a kite, really. And I realized that what was strange about what was going on was that I was fully aware of my circumstances. I was not following a dream story. There was no, there was no story at all. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a narrative in place. I wasn't solving some problem. I wasn't that agent on some planet trying to solve some crime or whatever, <laughs> wherever your dreams may take you. There was no story whatsoever. There's nothing was happening. I was fully aware. I knew that I had just driven my mother across town. I could even feel what position my body was laying in, and yet I was here in this fully immersed, fully realized forest. So I started walking around a bit, and I said, well, I'm going to walk around. Where the heck am I? What's going on here? What, what is this state of consciousness? And it was... I had no background with what people would refer to as a religious experience. I was not raised in a religious household. I wasn't raised in a particular, particularly spiritual household at all. In fact, my, my parents were very open-minded, but I had the type of parents who, they never really gave me the answers, the big answers, like, son, this is what God is, this is what the universe is. They never told me any of that stuff. They just were kind of the type of people who would say, figure it out for yourself. So I had no context whatsoever or background for what it means to be in a religious, having a religious experience, but I'm like, well, this fits. Everything I've ever read about through the ages from whether it's been Greek philosophers or anything from Hinduism or Buddhism or, or anything from the Bible, this fits for some reason. So I started walking around a bit more through this forest and I realized that there was another aspect to this that I could sense I was not myself somehow. I was sort of watching this play out through somebody else's eyes and I could sort of look at my hands on some level and kind of look around me and realize that I am a child. I'm about maybe seven or eight years old and I am possibly a native of this of this territory and I am not supposed to be in this particular area. I, I start being able to tap into whoever this child is who I'm kind of watching through their eyes. I can kind of start tapping into a little bit of knowledge of this person. Uh, he had a tribe. His tribe was just to the west of me and I could even picture the the kind of settlements and these were not teepees or anything like this. These, these were more uh, these dome-covered uh, homes that they would build. I believe that they're called utes. I could be wrong about that. I'd have to look that up. But they're not the typical teepees that I was picturing uh, a different structure than that. I knew that I wasn't supposed to be in this part of the woods for some reason. And as I walked around, I realized something looks familiar here. All this whole layout looks familiar. I've seen this before. And at that moment, a house sort of shimmers into existence for a moment off to my left. And it is my cottage from Dowajak, Michigan, that I spent my summers at as a child. 
However, there were no roads, there were no buildings, there, once the house vanished back into the ether, there was nothing there at all except woods and a cleared out area that was mostly sand where, where I was at, where the, the home would have been. And I realized I'm essentially seeing something, I'm seeing a vision from possibly a couple hundred years ago. And I still didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if, again, I knew that I was, I, my body was back in bed and everything was perfectly normal on, on that side of reality, but what was actually happening on what I was experiencing, I'm not sure. I just knew that, I know that this is a vision. I know that this is perhaps not actually taking place, but yet everything was more real than anything else I could have imagined. I'm tapping into this child's memories, and the child, again, he was not supposed to be in this area, and this is an area that the elders, for some reason, would come to do their rituals, to pray, to meditate. And there was one particular spot on the ground that I knew that was perhaps the shaman of the tribe or the, the spiritual advisor of the tribe. That was where he meditated. There was a spot where I was forbidden to go, you know, go to this spot. Already wasn't even supposed to be in this area. I was certainly not supposed to be anywhere near this particular spot where our holy man sat and communed with the cosmos. So of course that's right where I went. I dashed right over to it and I sat down on that spot and sat there for a moment and deep below the surface of me perhaps a mile below the surface of the earth, I could hear this rumbling of some sort, this motion. It sounded like a freight train that was slowly moving up from the center of the earth straight towards me. And as this energy grew, my pulse kind of quickened, and then it slammed up and it hit me all at once, and my consciousness for only way I can describe it, it exploded out of my body and into the cosmos. I could actually see galaxies and whatnot shooting past me for a moment. And it was the most beautiful and the most terrifying experience I'd ever had. The next moment I knew I was sitting up in bed, screaming at the top of the lungs, and I'm so glad that no one was home because they probably would have put, taken me to a psychiatrist, perhaps. What the heck is going on with him? Uh, what are you doing? Ian, are you on drugs? What are you doing? And I wasn't. Uh, the first thing I did after I, I was covered in sweat, I don't, don't know what the heck's going on, my first instinct was to run as fast as I could to the bathroom. And I looked in the mirror. I had to see my reflection for some reason. Now at the time, I had no idea why I did that. In retrospect, I now it makes perfect sense that I needed to know not just who I was, I needed to know what I was because my concept at that point of what consciousness is, how it lives inside the body, how you can possibly connect with perhaps another consciousness, all of that was shattered for me within a matter of minutes. This whole experience probably took maybe three, four minutes or so, something like that. And that was my first experience with what, there's a lot of different words for it, what is lucid dreaming? Some people will say that that's astral projection, but I didn't know what those words meant at, at all at the time. Again, this is 30 years ago. And there was no internet, really. The internet really wasn't really a thing at that point. Uh, the internet was just sort of, you know, kind of in its infancy. So there, it's not like I could just go online and go, what the heck just happened to me? All I knew was, what just happened was not a dream. That was the only thing I was sure of. Like, this was not a normal dream. S something else happened. I have no idea. After that first experience, I spent about the next 15 years having these experiences regularly. Uh, nearly every night, this went on. Sometimes these experiences would go on for minutes. Sometimes they'd go on for hours. And as these progressed, I uh, found myself at a lot of bookshops 
to begin with because I didn't know where to start. I had no idea. Where do, where do I go? Do I turn to religion? Do, maybe they have the answers. What's happening with me? Should I go to neuropsychology? Am I having seizures possibly? What's going on? Is there something neurologically wrong with me? Is that possible? I did get checked out. I did have my parents have to take me to a, to a physician. They ran basic tests and whatnot, and uh, I was in perfect, perfect health. Nothing's wrong with me. No sign that I had been having anything seizure-like symptoms or anything of the sort. And there was no reason for me to check into a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I was, for the most part, beyond these bizarre experiences, I was fairly healthy for a teenage boy. So as these progressed, I, I kept researching because I had to know. I had to, I was a curious person to begin with ever since I was a little kid, but this, I needed answers. I had, I didn't care what the answer was, if the, if the answer was going to be found in science, if the answer was going to be found in even the, the Bible or uh, the Quran, I didn't care where I found it. I just needed who else has experienced these sort of things. Uh, so for years, I, while I was having these experiences, I started studying. And so now I'm a mild expert in everything from Hindu traditions of lucid dreaming, that's some of the earliest forms of lucid dreaming uh, that have progressed into Buddhism. The Greeks had some concept of lucid dreaming. And of course, this is all tied into a lot of different spiritual traditions around the globe. Everybody has their own concept of it. So lucid dreaming, fine, great. I could accept that. I had no real problem accepting that internally that, all right, so I'm waking up. Somehow it is possible to wake up while you're inside a dream. People have claimed this for a long, long time. But as I mentioned, this wasn't a, an area that was really taken seriously for the longest time because there was no proof. There was no real evidence that any of this was actually happening. Most psychologists or perhaps and, uh, neurologists, for the most part, their attitude was, you're just dreaming that you're waking up. You're just dreaming that you're awake, but you're still caught in a subconscious vision. And that can happen, so that can be kind of confusing. I don't know if any of you have ever had a dream where, let's say you're being chased by some terrible madman, some creature. And there's a part of you that's going, I know none of this is real. I know this isn't really happening. You ever had that experience, anybody, where you're kind of like, I kind of know that this isn't really, somehow this ain't quite right but you're still gonna run away from whatever the heck's chasing you, right? So that's not a full lucid dream. A full lucid dream is where you fully stop, the entire story shuts down and you go, oh, none of this is real, none of it. Not that, not the creature chasing me, not even my body, none of, none of it's real. So as I said, I, I could accept the concept of Okay, I'm waking up, I'm becoming aware of my dream states. Each vision I had, each, uh, each night, I was taken to a new place. Sometimes I was taken back to that spot on the ground in Michigan. Uh, that was interesting. I don't know what to think about that still in many ways. Uh, I'd say possibly a hundred of my lucid dreams over the years took place surrounding that particular spot on the ground. It's an area that was on the the, the corner of our property in Dwajak, Michigan. It was uh, this, this home was built by my grandparents in the 1940s. My father helped build some of this cottage. And what was interesting is that, uh, yes, there, they, they, there was a tribe that lived off to the west, as I did more research. They didn't live in teepees. They lived in these dome-shaped utes. They, the area where the our house specifically was built was built on a clearing just as I had just as I had seen it. I'm a very rational person. My dad was a mechanical engineer. So I was taught from a very young age, part A fits into part B, and that is how those things fit together, and that's how logic works. So I was raised with a very rational way of looking at things I had to understand. So those details that all right. There's a lot of strange coincidences that perhaps, you know, my, my brain was toying around with, but that certainly doesn't mean that, what, I time traveled? 
I mean, <laughs> that's, that, to me, that's, it was laughable. It's ridiculous. Like, so I, I saw some vision. Maybe I saw something from some ancestor that was somehow, maybe it was uh, information that's locked in my DNA. I mean, there have been some theories that uh, we have information stored from our ancestors in ways that we never, we never imagined. As the dreams continued, however, it got weirder and weirder as the years progressed. And what I realized is that when I would enter these states, uh, I first had to start doing little tests to begin with. How, have you, how many of you have ever seen a movie called Inception? Leonardo DiCaprio? Inception, great film. One of the things they do in Inception, Inception is all about entering dream states, consciously being aware, entering somebody else's dream states. And the problem in Inception, one of the problems that our, our heroes deal with is that they start losing touch with reality a bit and they have to start having tricks to know what reality am I in? Am I, am I awake? Am I dreaming? Because again, these states can be hyper real and I started finding that, that I was lucid dreaming so much, reality started breaking down for me on some level, essentially, and I was starting to kind of lose my mind. Again, this was moving into my early 20s, and I was in college, and I was a typical college student with a typical college behavior. I, I drank beer, I ate pizza and Chinese food, and I partied, and the whole thing. I was not a guru living, you know, practicing yoga every day. I was on, on no level a monk, but I was having these experiences that were blowing my mind consistently each night and expanding my boundaries and forcing me to look at the world in a new way constantly. And it got to the point where I was not sure sometimes, well, what is real? How do I know if where I'm at right now is totally, absolutely, is it a dream state? Is it a vision? What's happening? In the movie Inception, they have what are called totems that they use. And those of you who remember it, and each person has their own little totem. And it's a little toy that they keep, usually in their pocket or something. And Leonardo DiCaprio, he has a top. And he knows that if he spins the top, uh, how does it work in the... If he's dreaming, it will spin forever. Is that right? I think that's how it works, if I'm not mistaken. If he's in a dream state, his top will just spin forever. And everybody has their own little trick. I developed my own personal little <laughs> trick. And it was one of the few things that was, I was able to get. It was my first experience of having some control over these states. Because these states, I was not trying to get into these states of consciousness. I was never reading about these type of things. I was not, again, not experimenting with hallucinogens at, at the time. Maybe later things change, but at the time I wasn't. So uh, I wasn't trying to do this. This was all coming about very spontaneously. One of the things I found that I could do is that uh, once I even suspected once I just had an inkling that I was possibly in a dream state, I learned a trick from a series of books uh, from Carlos Castaneda, if anybody may be familiar with those, uh, some of our old hippies in the room perhaps. Carlos Castaneda, I, I don't know what to think about uh, the, how realistic and how tr truthful he was with all of his information, but he had some experiences and he had advice in some of these books that absolutely worked for me if nothing else, and one was that as soon as you even suspect that you are dreaming, you lift your hand up in front of your face and you stare at it. That's it. You just stare at it. You hold your attention to your hand. If you are in a dream state, anything that you hold your attention to for too long will shapeshift in some manner. This appears to be universal. People who have been studying this across the globe, for whatever reason, there is some universal quality about holding your attention to something in a dream state. If you hold it long enough, that object will dissolve, change colors, vanish. It will do something. So that's what I started doing. I started, as soon as I suspected, well, well what's real? What's, I started doing it even during the day. Because I didn't know. I wasn't positive. Am I dreaming? Am I in a dream state? I started bringing my hand up in front of my face. And I'll tell you this, when your hand shapeshifts right in front of you, there is no doubt any longer that you are now in a dream. Something clicks in your head. I mean, that's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty big indication when all of a sudden, I, over the years now, I've had everything happen to my hand. I've, it's vanished. It's changed colors. I have seven fingers. It's turned into different animals. I, it's 
popped off my wrist and ran away. It, hundreds of little things that, will, that have happened. Uh, anything can happen at that point. But like I said, once you see your own body, some body part shape shift right in front of you, it's like a, an electric field that just runs through your body. Oh, I'm in a dream state. I'm in a visionary state. And now, you're no longer connected to the narrative. That's the trick. That's what I had to really learn was my first lesson, that that's where the, all the power was. All the power wasn't in how amazing everything looked, even though it was incredible, how realistic everything was. And that was amazing. But now I could realize that, oh, it's all about detaching from the story, whatever story's going on. Once you detach from the story, once you set it aside, you can step away from the story and you go, okay, now I know none of this is real. I am in the moment. I'm not caught up in my memory. I'm not caught up in another story. I'm present. I'm awake. Only then do you have agency. Do you have some sort of ability to now go shape the dream however you want. Now you have the ability to if the, you're being chased by a monster, now you can, it's a joke to you. You can stop it in its tracks. You can turn it into a butterfly. Or you can just stop everything entirely. I learned through these techniques. I started practicing like, oh, I can make anything happen. I can literally make anything happen in these states. I mean, it's your dream, right? So if you can imagine being fully awake, fully conscious, you're, not, you're no longer chained by the neck to some storyline. There's no dilemma to solve. Once you are free, you can do anything. And so that's what I ex started experimenting with more and more. How far can I take this? What does that really mean? So one of the things I first started doing, uh, well, I was young, so I was, I chased girls around a lot, which is some people, that's, some, that's, that's the only reason some people do get into lucid dreaming. They're they will chase after sexual experiences. You can have any fantasy you want, and that's absolutely true. I actually do a video series on, on all of that. I'd say if that's all you're looking for, you're not going to be real successful if you're not looking for something a little higher than that. Uh, there's reasons for that, but uh, we can talk about that later if we want. But I started looking for people I knew. Well, I want to see my mom. I, I was at college. I was uh, going to Ball State University outside of Indianapolis, Indiana at the time. My parents, I grew up outside of Chicago, as I said. My parents lived about two and a half hours away. Well, I want to see my mom. Let's see what mom's doing. And this is after I'd been lucid dreaming now for about four years, somewhere around there. So I, one way, I, the way I learned how to travel to different places is that I would intend it to be behind a door. There is a very, that's, a, that's a very common technique for a lot of lucid dreamers. You go, I want this, this is where I want to be, and it's behind that door. And then you go to the door and you open the door and there it is. Uh, we can talk about why that is too. That we have a psychological attachment to doors. If we did not grow up in this time and space, it, we would not be dealing with doors, of course. But, so I go find mom the first time. Where's, what's mom doing? At the time that I was asleep, it was about 7.15 in the morning, and I found her in the kitchen of my home two and a half hours away outside of Chicago, and she is making breakfast. And I can see the clock on the kitchen, on the kitchen wall. I can see, oh, it's 7.20. Same time that I'm actually in, that's interesting. I can see what she's wearing, and suddenly she drops all of the pans that she had been pulling out of under, underneath, the, underneath the stove, and she, you know, and I can hear her mildly cursing, like, oh, I gotta go pick this up, and yada yada, and everything else, and puts it all back, and it was just kind of fun, neat little scene. I wake up just about whew, 10 minutes later, and just on a whim, I decide, eh, I'll give mom a call. Why not? Let's be scientific about it. Let's just see what mom was doing, you know, 20 minutes ago or so. So I said, Mom, this is a weird, this is gonna be weird. I need you to tell me exactly blow for blow. What were you doing about 7.15? And 
To my horror, she goes and explains precisely what I had seen, down to what she was wearing, down to dropping pans all over the floor. And uh, I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that at all. That was not amusing to me. And I find that still interesting to this day when I talk to people who are self-described spiritual people who like to talk about concepts about astral projection and out-of-body experiences. And all I can say is that uh, when you're possibly faced with that being a reality, it's, it, it's, it's no longer fantasy. It's no longer just theoretical. It can be frightening. And to me it was. To me it was, I didn't like the idea, and I was still very doubtful. Fine. I know my mother. I know the patterns that she has. It's not that crazy that I would have possibly even kind of known what outfit she was wearing. I rationalized it away. But I'm going to be scientific about this, and I'm going to keep trying this. So each lucid dream I went into, I'd go find somebody else, some friend who I, who I had contact with who I could find later. It was somewhere around the fourth time where I was getting the reports back of seeing precisely what was going on, in some cases, hundreds of miles away. I said, okay, all right, <laughs> like, well, then what does that mean? What the heck, How, what is the connection between waking up in these dream states and what I've heard spiritual people talk about astral projection out of body, you know, and leaving the body. How is, what is the, why would those two be connected? My brain just fell apart. I, it made no, no sense whatsoever. And now I was a little less sure about these little fun games that I was having at night because, you know, it was fun. It was entertaining. I was seeing all crazy, all kinds of crazy visions and visiting these wonderful places. And now I was faced with this idea that Somehow, this wasn't just taking place in the comfort of my bed while I was asleep. Something was either leaving, I don't know what that meant, or somehow I was connecting with the outside world while this was happening. And the more that I, I toyed around with this, the more I was able to pay attention to all of the little in-between parts that I had been not really noticing, not really focusing on, that there was parts to these dreams where I could actually feel myself separating from my body. I could pull back and I could feel a, uh, an electrical sensation is one way I've, I've described it. It's a, there's something electrical about it that uh, is, is one way to describe it. And I started remembering there's always this pull, that I'm being pulled away from the body and then at the end of these experiences, I'm being pulled back. It's almost like a magnet on some level. There's a magnetic draw back, back to the body. So I had to really wrestle with that, and that took quite a bit of time. And it was almost like each time I came, became a little more comfortable with this next strange, insane thing that was happening, it's like then something was saying, all right, well, now it's time for the next level, the next level up. And that's where I started being able to do things like I could see myself sleeping. And watching your body asleep is a heck of a thing. Uh, that, that's something I, that took some time to deal with and, uh, and whatnot. But what I really wanted to know was, what's this all about? What is happening? Is there a point to all of this? It was fun, it was neat, it's interesting, but I wanted to feel like there was something else behind this. Is there some other grand reveal behind all of, all of these things that are happening? And I realized that ultimately what I was being shown was it had nothing to do with dreams. It had nothing to do with being able to leave my body whatever that meant. I still can't really tell you completely what that means. There's uh, 3,000 different spiritual people who will tell you all about exactly how that works, and I, I've, I've read a lot of different ideas on it, and I don't know what to tell you. I, all I can say is what I've experienced personally, that, yeah, there is uh, some sort of disconnect there. And there can be a disconnect, that the body and consciousness are not necessarily one and the same.
So, what I had to realize was that this was not about dreaming, it was about waking up, as I said. This is more about waking up to the truth, waking up to what, what I really was, and, I, and kept bringing me back to my first instinct on my first experience that once I was shown this larger world, I the first thing that I did as I ran into the bathroom, I had to see my reflection. I wanted to know, am I still me? What is me? That was the question, ultimately, that I didn't really know what was going on. What is the I? What is it? And why did this just happen? What was so miraculous about that? And it comes back to, once again, the narrative that we are attached to. We are all attached to a narrative all the time. The more that I realized this, the less I started, I started lucid dreaming less. And it was at that point, first of all, I kind of went through a bit of depression because I was missing it. I was kind of missing these experiences. But I, I accepted it for what it was, and I started realizing that, ah, now what I'm, what I'm seeing here is that it's time for me to take this consciousness into my daily life and understand, okay, this isn't just about the dream world, this is about the rest of my life. So what does this mean for my life? And I had to understand that everything that I've been taught through lucid dreaming and astral projection, I don't like that word personally, it's, it's, that's one word people use, it really is teaching you about what we are dealing with all the time in our life. And it comes back to the narratives that bind us. Because in a dream, we are taught as humans, it's a lesson for us all, when you're in a dream state, you are bound to a story. You're bound to some, the drama of the, of the story. You are trying to solve some problem, right? On some level, you're running from something, you're trying to solve some, some something, some dilemma, right? There's some kind of drama going on. And you're chained by the neck to Plato's cave, right? You are forced to watch the play that's going out. You're forced to, to react to it. I had to realize that that's what my life is, though. I'm running through a narrative. We are all running through a narrative. We have been told what this world is and how it operates since we were born. Since all of us came into this world, those who cared for us, those, the teachers, our caregivers, our parents, siblings, and then on to whoever else we trusted have been telling us in one way or another how the world works. They've been shaping it for us. To the best of their ability, hopefully, I mean for the most part. So it now lives, these stories now live as a running narrative about what is going on and we take reality as our brains tell it to us. So right now, as you are sitting here, watching me flay around in, in front of this podium on this lovely uh, hot summer night, you all have a story right now. There's a story running. Now, I'm not, there's stories happen on many different levels. There's the big story. We all have the big, if I, if I asked you to tell me the story of your life, right, you could start back at childhood and tell me the whole, the whole shabam. That's the big story. We don't run through the big story through our, through our heads all day long. We run through the little, the little smaller ones. Right now, you all have a story about how you got here, how you came to be in this room, what you were doing before. You came up here to the second floor. You, for whatever reason, came to listen to uh, this fool talk to you for about crazy stuff for a couple hours. And you also, beyond that, you have, an, have a story about what you're planning on after this. What, well, after this, you're going to dinner or you're going home. You all, there is a story going on. Even if it's absolutely true, it doesn't matter if the story is true or false or you know, actually conforms to reality. All of you have some sort of narrative that's going on in your head. And the trick is that we have to start learning to pull back as much as we can, to just stop, to stop the talking, to stop the internal dialogue because that's what our internal dialogue is doing all day long. Our brains are telling us, it is weaving a story about who we are and how we connect to this world, what our relationship is to everything in this world. 
And if we ever want agency, if you ever want to truly do that thing where you're following your dreams, you're becoming, uh, you want to become more peaceful, you want to achieve some particular goal, whatever that might be, or even if you just want more happiness in your life, I had to realize that I had to take my lessons into the daily world. I had to realize that I had to stop and learn to put everything on pause and go, what is going on right now? Where am I right now? Without the story, without the narrative, without the, the constant chatter. And we crave it. We crave that chatter. We're in a place now in our world where we don't know what to do without the constant narrative keeping our world in order because that's truly what it comes down to. All of the narratives that we are attached to, whether it's in our brains or if it's on our phones or on our televisions, it's all ultimately serving the same purpose. It's organizing your life. The brain loves a story because what is the brain doing all day? The brain is taking in millions and millions and billions of pieces of information, pieces of data, everything that's going on around you. The brain's job is to take all of that information and close it down to something that is streamlined and manageable. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's amazing that we're able to do that. That's what our stories do for us. It, it shuts everything down. It takes, it takes the, the large and it puts it down into the small. The brain loves it. We're addicted to it, in fact, in many cases. Stories do this. Little images on our phone can do this, even if it's just watching a, a dog try to get into the trash can or a cat doing something cute for a moment. Jumping from one narrative to the next to hold our minds in place. But when we are held in place and you're held in these focus, when you're held in focus to a narrative, you do not have full awareness. Your consciousness is shut down. The only way to truly wake up, turns out, is to shut down all of the stories. And that can start with, you know, for me, I have, of course, I have a cell phone and I have a laptop. My relationship now is what I would say with my cell phone is very different than it was even 10 years ago, I'd say. Now it's in my backpack and I barely even turn the thing on. I use it when I need to. There's no longer an addiction to it anymore. I can put it down. And that is something that a growing number of, of us can't do. It's, uh, it's actually a phobia. It's, they have a name for it even. It's called nomophobia. I can't, I can't walk away from my phone even for a moment. I need the story. I need something holding me together. But power and peace and love and all of those things that we truly cherish, those things that we are often sorely lacking in this world, come from being present, being truly in the moment. And that takes quieting the stories, both outside and inside. And so, eventually I learned that I had to start learning how to meditate. And my meditations took on a very, I don't subscribe still to any particular religion or philosophy, but I would say uh, the one thing that I have come across is generally what the a Zen Buddhist meditation, where you are truly just going into peace, you're going into silence, you are, you are not visualizing, walking on a beach or anything like that, you are trying to become peaceful and close down the internal dialogue. They're trying to quiet the internal dialogue. The more I've learned to do that, the more I have been acquiring those same kinds of gifts that I had in my lucidity. I'm now living more to my potential. The more I learned how to do this, the more I started putting myself in place where I really needed to be. I started doing those things that I've been putting off forever. I'm going to write a book someday. You know, I, I've been saying that for years and years. I'm going to write a book someday. I got this really great idea. And, uh, then I started actually doing it and I started doing those things and I started actually take, find, I found myself taking more action in my daily life. So moved from lucid dreaming and then into, into my daily life where I started taking more agency of my life. And uh, some of what you're seeing here, uh, what you've been watching here, are my attempts to try to show what some of these states 
look like. Being an artist, I thought, well, the best I can do to try to share them is to uh, perhaps paint, in some cases, what I had been seeing. Uh, so everything that you see here on some level came from some visionary state over the years. And uh, I wasn't always trying to capture, of course, the exact thing that I saw as much as I was trying to tap into the feeling, the feeling of, of what some of these states are like, the, the ecstasy of being free. Because there is a bliss to being outside of your narrative. It is incredibly, it's, it's, it's where all real peace starts with, is what, I, what I've come to find. So I've now written a couple of books. I now create a video channel where I've been trying to take these thoughts take these stories from over the years because, as I said, this my lucid dreaming went on for about 15 years or so real heavily. I still lucid dream, but now I'd say I lucid dream now maybe a couple of times a month at most now. I, and now I meditate, so all of my awareness has now moved into more of my daily life. I would say that uh, lucid dreaming actually became a bit of a problem after a while. I was doing it so much. I wasn't sleeping properly. That is one possible problem that some people can, can deal with. Uh, by the time I was probably in my mid-20s, I was not getting regular REM sleep. And you need healthy, normal REM sleep also, it turns out. Uh, I was not, uh, things started to break down more for me psychologically. So it was a good thing that uh, they, they pulled back. So that's where I, that's more where I am today. I have, at this point, as Cynthia mentioned, some of the other stories that, that, uh, that have happened now over the years. As I've been on this journey now, it's expanded into so many different areas of what people generally call the paranormal. And uh, I talk about that on my shows and some of my other podcasts and whatnot, why I think this possibly happened to me, why, why I, you know, the type of person I was, the sort of mindset that I had. Uh, one thing that kind of possibly gave me a boost is that I'm technically labeled, this has become a term that's become falling out of fashion with terminology wise, I'm technically a high functioning autistic. That only really means in my case is that my relationship with symbolism is uh, not the same as what most people's relationship is with symbolism. And that, that's a, that's a mouthful right there because that, that means everything, how our brains interpret symbols. That means the way I deal with media, the way I interact with my own internal dialogue, I've always had a distance, a natural distance from it. To a lower functioning person, their distance from their own internal dialogue and their own internal language is so far that language to them is such a problem they almost, in many cases, they can't speak at all. As you can see, that's not my that's not my particular problem. <laughs> but I have a distance from it, and I always had a distance from everything, starting with my own thinking. There was always a distance, so I think that I slipped into these a little bit easier. But uh, certainly not magical. There was no uh, uh, I was not uh, given some uh, special gift from. Uh, parents who lived in the wizarding world or anything like that. I, I think that everything that I have come across is perfectly natural. Are we watching time? I am. Yeah, okay. It's fine. Okay. Good. Ooh, oh, I hit it good. What was I saying? <laughs> um, wizarding world. Yeah. I was going to make another point about this being a natural thing. I am not a person who likes even the word supernatural. I really don't. The, what, is the, what does the word mean, supernatural? Super, above, beyond, natural. The idea that something is above or beyond nature, to me, that's not what these experiences add up to. I think that what I've been tapping into and what I started spontaneously tapping into was the most natural thing. If there is something unnatural, it's that we are bound that we're bound to these ridiculous stories in our head about who we are and how limited we are. And that's how, you know, it doesn't take much for that to be really unhealthy. Even if it sounds healthy, all of us had somebody in our lives growing up who, you know, tried to tell you 
something about who you were that wasn't positive and that carried you, you carried it with you. You know, sometimes it's to the that's ex, those stories are extreme to the point where you know, people are still dealing with stress from abuse and trauma from a very young age, and it comes back to who people told them they were. But what I'm saying is that all of us have been told some story that's not entirely true about what we are, who we are on this planet, who we are as conscious beings living in this world. We are so much more that we, I can't even put into words. There's no way to put into words. The, that's how power works in the present moment. It is so completely, uh, we're, bubble, we're, we're bubbling with energy. We're surrounded by energy all the time constantly and uh, the only way to tap into it is to be fully present you can't think about something from the past and really tap in any sort of real power you can't project into the future it's all in your imagination power is always right here in the moment we're the ones that have to meet it there so with that how about we take a break and any questions whatsoever uh, I throw them at me Whatever you got. We got about, what, 20 minutes? Is that right? About nine? Is that good? We all good with that? Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's start with one. Okay. What's your experience, or what's your, uh, yeah, what's your experience with flying in, in the lucid dreams, and how, how have you been able to control that? Or do you, have you fly? Ooh, well that's a good one. It sounds easy, and it's not. That's not a. It's not a good answer. So flying is a is a huge one. That is a. That's a big common experience uh, for a lot of lucid dreamers. It is the most wonderful experience to have. Um, I learned that at first, most of this was spontaneous. For almost all of these experiences, from my perspective, they were. It, it was as if these were just happening to me. I was not trying to do anything for the longest time. It wasn't until later that I started finding ways to, to, in, to, to learn how to direct this, and that all, that all came from intention. It all came from setting my focus on what it is that I wanted to do, and then it's basically like you set your intention and then you release. It's laser focus, and then you just release. So if you, wanna, if you wanna fly, that's what you are focusing on. This is what I'm gonna do, and you leave absolutely zero space for doubt. Doubt is another one of those other narratives. Doubt really is just another story that's coming in. So if you can shut shut that off, there, you have zero doubt whatsoever. I'm going to fly, and you fly. And what I also learned is that I could do other little tricks that would help me connect with flying. I learned that I could shape shift. That was, that became pretty pretty nice. So I for a while I was just like, well, I'm just going to sprout wings and fly like a bird. So I did that for a while, where I would just say, well, now I'm a bird. And, <laughs> You've got wings, and now you can fly. And uh, But still, I would say that in terms of control, it's a funny thing. Uh, I would say that control is not the, exactly what you might think it is in lucid dreaming, and I, it's, a, it's kind of odd. It's, it's more, the way I describe it is it's like sailing a boat. You can get really good. If you get really good at sailing a boat, what you're really doing is learning how to work with the waves and the wind to direct yourself in the right place. It's not just charging forward and going in this particular direction. You have to learn how to work with, there's a lot of other energies out there when you are in a lucid state. And what that means, that, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, does that kind of answer yep. your question? Do you mind if I keep asking? It, well, did somebody else really need to jump in? I, well, let's come no, back. Oh, really. yeah. Sure. Go for it. Oh, well, I just was going to ask how you connect remote viewing. Like what you were describing to me is some people use remote viewing. Is there any connection in your experience? Is that a completely different journey? So when, when you, I'm assuming we're talking about remote viewing that you are generally doing from a, medi like kind of a meditative state. Is that what we're talking about? Because generally when we talk about remote viewing, that's usually... We, we are meaning something slightly different than astral projection a little bit. Astral projection is usually done from like, you know, a, either a deep meditative, meditative state or even a near-death experience that you essentially are getting the same thing. What you are doing is you're moving the body out of the way on some level. Uh, 
if that makes sense. Really all of this comes back to is moving the body out of the way. Because the body is what is attaching us locally to where we are right here. My body is in one place at one time. That is, that is how I move through this world, right? When we go into a meditative state, what we are trying to, doing, trying to do is release the body. We are trying to move the body aside so we are only dealing with the consciousness. When we are dealing with the consciousness, then the consciousness is not bound to a place and time. So I'm kind of answering your question in a larger framework. This can, that can happen, that basic dynamic can happen in a lot of different ways. In a near-death experience, the body can be taken out of the picture in a very violent way. You are on a hospital bed in an ICU being operated on, or you are in a coma or something like that. The body is taken out of the way, if that makes sense. And so a lot, that's the stories you start hearing. People coming back from surgery, waking up and going, I left, I was, in, I was somewhere else. But that's not essentially, that there's really no difference between that in a, the lucid dream states I'm talking about, the body is just being set aside in a slightly different manner. In that state, my body's just asleep. And, but you can also do it through meditation. I personally cannot go into a meditation and go from a meditation into an astral projection. I have lots of friends and people I've dealt with over the years who claim that they can do that. I, that's that's not where I'm at, <laughs> as far as skill, as <laughs> my skills are where they are right now, but, but uh, that would be, it would follow that you should be able to do that as well. Completely drop the body, separate from that, and be just consciousness. And separating from the body always means also you are separating from your story. Right. Your story is connected. It's like Thank you. When you talked about uh, your mother and tuning into her, yeah. that sounded to me like a remote healing. Like, um, it, because you were able to go, you know, and, and witness what she was right. doing in there. Yeah. So, I mean, do you, do, how, how, can you speak to the difference between uh, <laughs> What's the difference, right? state and a remote viewing? Uh, I, you know, experience? sure. Yeah, what's the difference, right? And I think that for me, I would say that we get too hung up on the terminology. Uh, I, that's how it always seems to me. That, and there's a lots of questions of like, well, at what point is it a lucid dream, and at what point is it an astral projection, and at what point? I don't know if those. I think that's the mind trying to put these into boxes. Is how it really feels to me. So I can all I can speak to is what's happening at the core, the mechanics. That's that's really all I do now in, through my books and in my videos. I'm really just trying to describe the mechanics behind all of it. And I'm like, yeah, I'll let, I'll leave everybody else to decide how they want to chop that up into, well, here's the line between this state and this state. And I've heard these different, lots of people will swear that, well, remote viewing is exactly this, and astral projection is this, and an out-of-body experience is over here, and, and then lucid dream. I don't know. I, you know, there was never any divisions in any of my experience where, you know, somebody came along and said, well, now you're on chapter six. <laughs> there was never, I'm like, okay, it was just one experience flowed into the next. So, you mentioned earlier when you were, it, it, it was spontaneous, so you, you can't necessarily make yourself go into a lucid dream. There we go. So, yes. That has not generally been my method. It's not generally been what I've, I, I was able to do this, it was just happening to me. So I never really had to pick up a lot of the techniques, but absolutely, this can be taught 100%. I would say that that's not my area of expertise because of the way these came to me. I didn't know what lucid dreaming was when this happened, so I never went through that, those steps, those processes. But what I would say is if you want to pick this up yourself, that's what you really, the, the two things you, you would want to focus on are, I would start with a meditation practice. If you've not already picked up a meditation practice during the day where you are constantly, st stop, you're stopping and you are doing something where you're shutting down the internal dialogue, you're detaching from the internal dialogue like I talked about. That is going to prep you for learning to stop the story in a dream state. So, because if you can stop it during the day, it's still, I mean, your dreams are essentially still just the noise, right? And it's the same thing happening in the dream state, but it's, uh, but it's just going, you know, in a different. So when, when you're actually in the lucid dream, yes, you don't have control over the narrative. Can you pick and choose exactly what you want to do? Absolutely, sure. Oh yeah, 
I can pick and choose. I can choose what I want to do. I could go where I wanted to go. I could mold. I could. I. I in if I was uh, fully conscious, like 100% full of energy, I could pick up objects that were around me and just shape them into whatever I wanted to. What got really strange is that when you're in a fully lucid dream state and you come across other conscious, seemingly conscious people, entities, animals that speak to you, and you don't know what's going to come out of their mouth next, and you can have fully realized conversations with them, and you're going, well, who's, where's this coming from? Me? Because I don't, I'm not aware of it, but the other, but I digress. The other thing that, you, uh, that I also suggested is that throughout the day, some people even set a timer. They put a little timer on their phone that every like hour and a half or so, you know, they'll have something go off, a little bell, something. And what you'll do is you stop, you put your hand in front of your face, and you just stare at it for a moment. You just hold your attention. And you just ask yourself, what's going on? Am I dreaming? And the idea is that eventually that will leak it will leak into a dream state. Hopefully at some point in a dream state you'll have just enough awareness to go, is this real? And then you'll go, oh, my hand. I'm going to stare at my hand. The reason I use the hand, and people can do anything. There's all sorts of tricks. Lucid dreamers will tell you about a thousand different tricks that you can look at a clock and the numbers will shift and you can do this. Lights don't work. Uh, there was a movie called uh, Waking Life that kind of talked about some of this stuff. If some of you have seen the movie Waking Life. And those are neat little tricks. I like the hand technique because that seems to be a universal thing that our hands are always in our, in our dream states on some form. There seems to be some built-in, our hands are our main tools that we use to interact with the world around us so they're always there. Remember the totems I talked about in Inception? My, my argument with that as far as your real technique is that that wouldn't necessarily be in my pocket. There's no reason to think that that top that Leonardo DiCaprio had would be in your pocket. It's your, you know, anything. You're, you don't know what you're going to run into. Everything's up for grabs, but your hands always seem to be there. So I can always lift my hand up and stare at it and go, what's going on? You know, will it shape shift? Well, what, sorry, if anybody else has questions, just jump in. I'm fascinated. Sure. Uh, in terms of the movie Inception, your concept of time in these dreams, is it... Is it similar to the way, the way it, they explain it's, it? It's the, it, yeah, but this idea that it slows down and whatnot, yeah. that is, that's not my experience, and that's not the, the what they've come up with when they've done the actual research uh, in terms of now they're able to hook up people to like MRI type of machines while lucid dreamers, and they go into a, a lucid dream state, and they're able to communicate with them, and they're able to get an idea of what their passage of time is, They've asked them, like, what's your, what's your idea of, like, how long a minute is? And it's very accurate. Uh, so that's what we've seen so far is that your passage of time is pretty, you know, is, is, is pretty clear and it's pretty stable. Um, that's how mine is as well. I've not seen that, yeah, that weird idea that, like, things are moving at a, yeah, several times the, the, the speed or something. Yeah, exactly. A question. Yeah. So uh, did you mom knew that you were there Ooh, oh. or 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 does That's so a good question so it could be your mom could be your girlfriend could be your your uh, someone stranger yep. do they do they know that you are there not so far not so far that was my question as well so and it made me start See, that's why I started realizing all of these weird paranormal things are all connected because I started asking if they're aware of me what what would they experience Am I a ghost at that point? I mean, we generally think of ghosts as being from the departed, people who have already passed on, but, well, maybe they're idiots like me who are lucid dreaming. I mean, who knows? So I have never had someone say that they could see me. I have had lots of stories from other people. I'm connected to a group of lucid dreamers online. We're called the Lucid Hive. We all create content. Several of them have had those exact stories where they have gone done the same thing to people, where they go and find friends, relatives, and that person has said, I, they even said that they've seen them for a moment, like I, you were standing there, like you were standing there for a moment that you vanished, you know, that sort of stuff. I've never, I've never seen that, I've never experienced that, and so far nobody who I've come across to felt that I was there, at least. But I think that you could. 
Okay, so lucid dreamers are definitely uh, have a, I don't know, special awakened abilities or different abilities uh, expanded. It, does lucid dreamer uh, lucid dream or lucid dreamer? I'm not sure. So, 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 you know, I'm a lucid dreamer, let's say, and you're a lucid dreamer. Okay. And let's have a session. And we go in and meet each other. Somewhere, yeah. Okay, in, in you know, on that astral plane, if you want to Whatever. call it. Is that basically say, hey, hi, hi there, hi, hi, hi. Right. hi. Does, does that happen in, in any of those, occur, uh, in your high, for example, right. or anyone is sharing that reality? I've got 101 stories from other people who claim that they have done that. I have no doubt that those stories, at least some of them are true is all I can say. I don't really have that same experience, but I have been able to, in lucid dream states, I, did con I was able to contact other people on that plane who had passed on, and I didn't even know had died. In one particular instance, it was a good friend of mine for, who I was friends with in high school. His name was Paul Miranda. He passed away. We had lost touch over the years. I went into a lucid dream state at one point, and I was able to talk to him, and he was telling me, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm going to the next the next realm, and he got into a train, actually, and, and took off in this train, and, I was, and he left me a note with, uh, with a heart a little note with a heart on it. There was blood actually on it. It wasn't gross. I mean, it was weird. There was actually, it was native blood, and it said a lost friend on it. That was the note that he left, and it wasn't until two weeks later that I found out that night he had died of a heart attack, mm -hmm. hundreds of miles away, and I lost, I lost touch with him. So my point is, is that that kind of stuff tells me that absolutely, uh, there is no disconnect. You can absolutely make a connection with other, with other beings, whether wherever they are. When they're in that state, why not? Absolutely. I have I have no problem. I have no question about that at all. Yeah. But I've not been able to go, yeah, let's go meet up at uh, yeah, the Astral Cafe at you know at, at midnight right after we, I, I've not been able to do that. Yeah. But I think it's possible. I like the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that and I don't have nearly as much experience as you, but I, okay. I I think you can test that with animals because they're sensitive to that, specifically cats. So like the remote viewing that you're talking about, mm. you could, um, you know, scare the cat, you can say that, but um, because they can sense you and then yeah. and then you can ask your mom, you know, the cat did this at certain such times with that and then that that's when I was there. Sure. I like the idea. I, I've never interacted with any pets or anything like that. That's well, all, all I can say. Never yeah, I never went. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I, and I've had, I mean, I've had lots of dreams about normal dreams about pets who had passed on and all that sort of thing. No, I can't say that I've, I can't think of any, yeah, running into pets or, or I've had connections with animals, lots, but none of them were anything that I was personally, in my personal life, actually connected to. Lots of animals, uh, yeah, that are. Were intelligent, so to speak. No, sorry, no, no. you're losing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, as far as negative energy is concerned, Oof. if you're sensitive to that, then um, how do you get protection when you're in that? When you're in the other condition, how do you get protection? From that? that is such a yeah. That? Yeah. yeah, that's a can of worms right there. Is what that is. Um, First of all, I would say that the, the, the number one thing to, I, I would be concerned if someone, let me answer it another way. I would be concerned about what is your narrative that you carry about negative energy? What is the story you carry about that first? I would definitely analyze that first, get to the heart of that. How do you really feel about that? What is it? Do you have a story connected to that? Because whatever your story is, that's what you're going to be dealing with in those states. For me, because I was not raised in any kind of a spiritual tradition or religious tradition, the idea of negative energies of shadow people and demons, and I've heard all of those different kinds of words thrown out by people who work in these same kind of fields, I have, they mean, it's a joke to me from my perspective. I'm like, I just laugh at it, it's like, whatever. Negative energies and, and bad things and whatever. I, I, I generally am able to just push that aside and I don't, I've not dealt with it. However, yes, <laughs> there are, there do appear to be 
things out there on those planes that uh, don't have your best intentions in mind. Just like people don't have the best intentions in mind for you on this plane, in this, in this reality, uh, you know, there's no reason why you're not going to find that also on that plane. Again, when I was going into those states at first, I was a college kid with no philosophy behind me. I wasn't some, you know, uh, pristine monk uh, living some sort of, uh, I don't know, pristine lifestyle or anything like that, a vegetarian lifestyle. You know, I was chasing girls and I was drinking beer and the whole thing, you know. So I would go into those states and sometimes I'd do the same sort of thing. So somebody could have also perceived me as a pain in the ass on that level. If they were also conscious, I don't know. I don't, it's hard to say like what that experience is for the other, for someone else. But uh, it would seem to follow that uh, yeah, if you're, whatever you're bringing with you, you're going to bring that with you into those states. However, in general, if you are waking up and you are learning these techniques and you're learning how to drop the dialogue, you're also doing a lot of healing. You know, that's, it's kind of hopefully in many ways, it's kind of hopefully a self-correcting uh, kind, of, kind of method, if that makes sense, that as you get more powerful into these higher states and you have more agency, you've also been doing a lot of cleansing of your own drama and your own stories that you've been holding on to, the things that would make you act out against someone else. It doesn't make you perfectly safe, but it would, it would be a, a start. I, does that kind of answer? If there's a couple, yeah, right behind you, yeah, yes. Have you had uh, experiences off this planet? More so than just off the planet, in what dimension, things I would call other dimensions uh, is the best way to describe it. There have been places that I've been to that uh, are not, they're not even of our universe is the best way I could s explain that. So what that means, I, I don't, I still couldn't tell you. I think that uh, a lot of people have experiences like that and they're 100% confident that they had an out-of-body experience to a, another planet and they could point it out, they could actually find it on a star map. I don't, I don't have those answers, but um, I would say that from everything I've experienced, I know what it feels like to be out of the body now. It's happened enough times where not only do I know what it feels like to be out of the body, I know what that experience, what the sensation is like when I am, for example, seeing friends and family, and I know I am, whatever you call it, I'm in another reality. I am viewing a reality that we all share, you know, with, with what they were experiencing. And so when the same exact, all of those same triggers are there, like, I know what it feels like to be outside the body, but now I'm not seeing my mother in the kitchen. Now I'm on planet X watching some other insane thing play out that makes no sense in our reality. There's a part of me that goes, well, whatever this is, this may be every bit as valid as, as my mother in the kitchen. Right, but it's just something that I've ne I've never seen. It's uh, it, but it's hard to say. It's hard to go. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely what happened. And I'm still on the fence, even with the story about being the, the Indian boy in in Michigan. When I when I talked about that, I have a lot of really good information that tells me that I think I was watching something. I, I was viewing something that happened from my perspective 200 years ago. But. In the larger scale of things, everything is happening in the now. Even quantum physics teaches us that now. Yeah. Everything's you happening in the moment. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. You don't think it was a past life? Yeah. That's another question that starts breaking down. We start breaking down those boxes. The further I've gone into this, what is a past life and what is my past life and what is your past life, those start getting real soupy. All those questions and those divisions, that gets tough. So. Sure, I might, and from one perspective, I could absolutely say perhaps that was somehow my past life. I, I think that's a reason, that's one reasonable way to say it, but what is mine, what belongs to me, and what I, I don't know, consciousness is consciousness at some point on those levels, you know, it's, yeah. I was wondering, with this question and everything, if you were this Indian boy and everything, what makes you think that you didn't just flip into the Akashic Records? Your Akashic Records. Absolutely. And I've heard yes. about the, those, that, the idea of the, the Akashic Records. That, that I love that idea, this idea that, and I had experienced what we call the Akashic Records far beyond, far before I ever read or even heard of that concept. And if those of you who may not have heard, it's this concept that 
in the universe, there's basically a, you could say library, but it's, it's a metaphor of everything that has ever happened. In terms of information in the cosmos, it, it's all there. We don't, we don't lose information. And again, I'm a real science-minded person, so I always bring all this stuff back to science and physics, that in reality, that's what physicists tell us, that information is not lost, even in black holes is what they think. We do not lose information. And I'm talking about every movement that every molecule has ever made since the Big Bang. There is a, a record on some level in the quantum field, a record of everything. So, yeah, the idea that tapping into that, it, it's, it's all right there, right? It's all right, it's all, you know, you tap into it, it's gonna be as, as real as, because what we are experiencing is part of the Akashic Records as well, right now, right? So it's... Yeah. Right, and the Book of Remembrance is how it's referred to in the Bible. But that's still okay. the Akashic Records. It's still, hmm. the, still the same thing. Nice. So a lot of people get it confused. But I work a lot with the Akashic Records, and it seems to me that it, I, I thought that immediately, that you had just yes. jumped into your Akashic Records. I think records. that's a perfectly, another good way to define it. Again, we're, it comes out of terminology. What are we going to call these things? But definitely. What? That's uh, that's one great way to, to think of it. So yeah. behind you, actually. Oh, oh, I was sorry. I was just going to underscore in that conversation oh. we were having, the opening that Ross gave us yeah. is to stay with I choose love. Yes. And I think when we get a sense that we're coming into an unfamiliar energy or whatever, that that's always an answer, mm. and that's yes. always a focal thing. So thank Amen. you, Ross, for sharing. Amen. That. I feel like it. It, it's just a... It is. It's, uh, it's a choice that you can make at any moment. Any moment. Any moment. It's always there. And changes. That, and that, that still changes. blows me away. Even now, it still blows me away that really, you can stop. You can teach yourself to stop literally at any moment. And you can s stand in the center of being, yeah. Yeah. of love, of what you really are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I... I <clears throat> When we wake up in a dream, we call it a lucid dream. We we're, we become awake in the dream. We and and we're and we are who we are. We're not a body. We're we're this energy of ourselves. And and so, I I read this book a long time ago called The Laughing Jesus, and it was an awesome book. It's, it's the first part is about dismantling the story about Jesus, mm, but the second yeah. part of it is called. <laughs> The book is the first part's called the bath water, the second part's called the baby. You don't want to throw the brown thing out, you know. So, so the first part is just the stories that you construct about your life and mm. or Jesus' life or whoever's life you're talking about. But then, but then the second part is what I love about it is it's called um, instead of lucid dreaming, it's lucid living. Yes. And waking up inside this dream that we're dreaming here that's because the next we step. don't know the much, how right. much difference there is. That is the next step. That's why I say that, that's why I called this, well if I'm going to call this little presentation anything, it's the first step. Lucid dreaming is one small, it's one small step and really now it, it really is about lucid living to, to waking up to this dream because you will wake up, all of us will eventually, eventually. It's undeniable, There's you don't even have an option. Eventually you will all wake up, you will eventually <laughs> realize this is it, this is, oh gosh, and you're going to laugh and go, I can't yes. believe I believed all that stuff, it was so ridiculous. <laughs> just like you wake up from your dreams now, you just you look back and go, well, that was crazy. Yeah. You're going to look back and look at this reality and go, my God, why did I believe any of that? It's so nuts. <laughs> That's how you know you're awake, you yeah. start laughing. You start laughing. <laughs> when, the, when the Buddha reached enlightenment, he, he laughed. So the uh, example you had where you were in your boy. That kind of, yeah. that seemed like it kind of happened to you, whereas when you described, I want to go visit somebody, you, you made that happen. You thought about, I want to go through this door and visit somebody. Have you ever, and that seemed to be the present, quote unquote, yeah. um, have you ever gone to visit somebody and it not be the present? Um. No, not from my recollection. That's that first, that's first vision that I. I have to give that some more thought. But from my recollection, that first vision was the only time I could really say that, if if there was 
moving into the past, that was that was really the only time that I really felt that I was I was at least about two hundred years or so. I was so typically when view, you, viewing the past. When you did visit somebody you were seeing exactly what it was happening. In the moment, at the exact same time. The same time that I was having that experience, that's what I was seeing them do. Yeah. yeah. Can yes? Can you pick a time in the future and visit it? And I know there's different timelines and different timelines inside, but yeah. have you been able to say, I'm going to go 20 years in the future-ish? Right. I'm what's your experience uh, what I found is that my best laid plans that I would have, it's all about my intention and what it is that I want to do in those states. What I would generally find is that if I was trying to intend something to get information for some reason, nine times out of ten, my desire came from some egoic reasoning, if that makes sense. I want the lottery tickets, for example, right? <laughs> That's one thing you might jump to. Like, well, can I just do that? The best thing I can, it's, it's, this gets abstract. I actually did a video just about this to try to explain it. That all sounds well and good. Yeah, I'm going to jump into the future and I'm going to get those lottery tickets, right? Once I go into that state, I'm no longer dealing with the person who cares about money. I'm no longer a person. I'm, I'm more of just a consciousness that is going to laugh at that because it then sees it all for the story that it is. Like, well, this is ridiculous. This whole thing is ridiculous. None of it makes sense. You realize it's all, it's all interconnected, and the concept of money is stupid, and you don't care anymore. And I have a hard time. My 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 motivations break down very quickly in those states. Is the best way to explain it, and it gets real fuzzy. So I've not, I, and and that happens so much. I honestly even question people who claim to be able to do that. I'm not sure if they're all full of crap. I don't know, but there's a lot of spiritualists out there who claim that they can purposely go into a, a, a remote viewing sort of mentality and then go get information from somewhere else. I, I question that just because of that. Because if there's a weird, it's like a catch-22 that seems to be that once you go into that state, you don't care about what it is that you're looking for. It breaks down. And I, I've, I've not yet heard of any really good reports or research that I really felt was absolutely 100% where I read somebody who was consistently able to do that, go grab information through astral projection or something. I, I've not yet found it. I'm, I'm still very much a skeptic about that. It's What's going on on that plane is a real, it's very spontaneous, and it's, there's, it's hard, to, hard to get focused sometimes in terms of what the ego wants. So, so you're saying that you have gone into the future? I've gone into places that appear to be in the future is the best I can say. I've been, gone into cities specifically that were fully realized and it's not what it's not what we've got on our planet right now is the best I can say. And there were humans there who I could talk to, I could communicate with. Uh, what that means, I don't know. <laughs> can you tell you? Yeah. Uh, sure seemed like the future and I have no problem with that. Uh, with the idea of moving into, the, again, the past and the present, and well, the past and the future are really, really, they're just concepts that uh, we, physicists actually don't even understand why we experience time the way we experience it. It's that bizarre. The idea that we experience moving from seemingly, you know, from the present moment moving into the future, they're like, all the math shows that that's not how the reality works at all, that it's all here. Everything is, even the microphone, it's all here, right? It's all here in one place at the same time in the now. The past, everything that's ever happened, everything that ever will happen, it is all in one, it's all one mess. So speaking of the mess, the now, uh, all the lives... Let me stop. Just let you guys know, it is going on 9.30. If any of you need to leave, you're not going to... You know, you're not going to make me feel okay. bad or anything. It is getting kind of late, so, you know, yeah. you're all good. So, yeah, But those of you who still have questions, uh, I'll talk to you all night if you yeah. let me. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we we are there to tell our clocks anyway. Uh, it, it's all happening now. It it's is. All, it's all, all the lives, parallel, future, past, whatever. It's all right now. Different realities different existences, um, different planets, star systems, galaxies, universes. Uh, 
let's go back to your mom. So we could have mom that w that is not human. That sure. no life sure. could been could been your mom could been someone on on another planet. Right. That is, um, we may call it extraterrestrial. Oh, I I visited places that I know that there's things that are wrong. For example, like I I have been I've astral projected say when I would go to my parents home sometimes I go looking for my folks and that's that's a that is by the way a really big draw it's very I, I found it very easy to go connect with people if I loved them if I had a, a heart connection with those people that was a very natural pull to go find mom to go find dad to find uh, the woman I was with at the time or, or something like that there had to be a heart connection anyway what I would often find is that when I would go say I could literally fly into, you know, through the window and into their living room. The things in the living room were often things that were never there. Th objects, things that were just off a little bit, you know, but yet the rest of what I was watching them doing was a hundred percent exactly what they were doing, but the things around them sometimes were just off. So what is that? Well, again, I had these experiences before I started reading the physics. And in fact, what's funny is that now at this point in my life, I don't even really read spirituality much anymore. I find physics more fascinating because every time I read something from, uh, you know, one of Carl Sagan or, or uh, one of these uh, theoretical physicists, they make as much sense to me now as some of the stuff I was reading from, uh, you know, Yoganendra and uh, the, the Hindus and the Buddhists and whatnot. It sounds, it's, it's the same thing, with, but they're looking at it from a different perspective. So uh, I don't know if that answers so, your question. Yeah, so, that's so, so you can uh, have, 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 have anyone you know, connected with their uh, galactic family, Pleiadians, Arcturians, right. uh, Lyrans, um, just go Syrians, just go down the line. Any of the local, local families, galactic families that we most likely have lived sure. and been part of. And so after I started getting more and more into this, I started seeing UFOs. Which, and that's a whole other diatribe that I could go off on for hours. And I had no idea, like, well, why, why? I was told by psychics before, long before this, they said, oh, you are going to start seeing UFOs. And again, I'm like, what the hell is the connection between me going into these dream states and UFOs? And you're, you're, you're tapping into it, is what, is what I'm saying. Once you start making those connections, you start you know, drawing those that conscious connection from possibly other galaxies, other realities, uh, it's very possible that you, uh, they pick up on that. Other, other beings, other races that are more advanced possibly, they may, you know, there's, there's theories that we are able to connect with them consciously. In fact, there's, there are people, I'm, I'm appearing in a documentary where we talk specifically about the connection between consciousness and UFOs, and that's, uh, if you guys check me out on uh, social media and whatnot, you'll see when that comes out. But, uh, that seems to make sense, that, that, that there may be a connection. I saw the first UFO I saw about a 14 years ago, out here in Boulder, actually. And uh, I realized very quickly that I was the nut job who had the, the UFO story. I'm like, oh god, now I sound even crazier than I did before. Great. I didn't even, like, I don't even want these experiences anymore. Uh, and then I was, when I would kind of meditate on those, those, experiences like what is that what is the what's going on there uh, the response was first that I was told that my parents would start seeing these things as well for whatever reason and uh, that I had a conscious connection with yeah some of these things that we we're seeing flying around I can't tell you what more that that means but about six years later my dad had a, a UFO experience in his backyard and it was quite weird what he saw was really bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, I could go on and on about that. I'm so seeing more of those all the time. It is, it is 9.30. It is. Um, I have one last question. Yeah, go ahead. And then yeah. You, when you said you've seen stuff that's not of this universe, yeah. how can you, I can't even put my mind around that. How would you even know if it's not right. of this universe? Uh, I've had conversations, for example, in those states with <sighs> sentient things that are not human, for example, that are more intelligent than me. That's <clears throat> tough to wrap your head around when you're like, well, this is theoretically my dream, so how can something else be more knowledgeable than I am? I, I've, and all I can say is that there's, there's things out there that I've communicated with that are they're not human, 
That's all. They don't look human. They, they've got, uh, they're able to communicate somehow, but uh, I've been in cities, for example, that are not built on any of the kind of architecture that we use. Uh, and I, I could be more specific, but it's just architecture that we don't use. I'm like, well, whatever, I don't know where this is. Is this the future? Is this Earth? Is this an alternate dimension of Earth? You know, the, none of that information comes to me when I go to these, when I would travel to these areas. It's not like, you know, I wish I had some sort of readout or something like, well, you're, <laughs> you're, you're this. I just can look around and kind of interact with what I can interact with and try to make the best of, well, what do, what do I appear to be seeing here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the only things that I can verify is when I would come back with information that I could go and look for. Uh, people that I've interacted with some uh, in places, like uh, when I was in, at college, I was really good at, I could uh, project around uh, the area, around the Indianapolis area, it's a place I had never been, and I could go find what, you know, what was in certain areas, and then I'd go take a drive, like, well, I think I was down here, and I'd go find the barn that I was just in, you know, the other night, things like that. So when you have that experience where you go, there's absolutely an undeniable connection. I'm able to go to other places that we all share that's in our reality. But then the next night, I'm on Planet X talking to uh, something that's not human. We're, you know, it seems to me that I, I didn't know where to draw the line. Like, well, what's real? What's not real? I still don't know. But uh, what kind of conversation. Some of it was about how things that are still over my head. I had a thing, I don't know what best described as a sentient uh, being that was sort of, looked very human, but it, it was, uh, the best I can say is that it just wasn't human. It didn't have our skin, so to speak. Uh, and the thing sort of shape-shifted a bit. And... It came out of the hole in the ground, like I mentioned that area in Michigan. I kept having these same dreams about this particular spot. What is that? Why am I dreaming? What is the connection here? What am I dreaming about here? And this creature came out. I'm sorry. Sorry, do you think that's an energy portal or a what? An energy portal? Well, that's what they said, and I didn't know what the hell that meant. <laughs> so that's essentially what this, he came out and he said, First of all, what you've been doing, you have been cleansing this energy portal for whatever that means, cleansing it. And I could picture what he was saying, but it was like looking at the most complex geometry of something. I'm like, I can't make sense of it, but it was like watching these intersecting lines. He's like, you see, like what you're standing on is this point that now we can all travel through this point through Earth, and somehow you're helping us connect all these other realities. Do you still have that property? What, uh, uh, yeah, it's in the family. It's owned by a, like a second cousin or something don't like that. It. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as I could, I went back to that property. I sat down on that spot as soon as I was able to get out there for the summer. I'm like, I knew where the spot was. It was kind of in the road at this point. They had paved it since I had been out there. Uh, but I'm like, I, I could feel it. I mean, I could feel like it's that. It's right here. And I just sat there and meditated. Nothing particularly strange happened when I sat there, but I I did it anyway, just to, like I had to. Yeah. Strange, uh, but that's what this thing said. It said, "You're yeah, you're dealing with uh, you cleanse this thing, and now." And he even said, "He said I want to give you something. What can I give you?" And uh, I, he was wearing this. It was strange. It was this green and white, this weird striped. It was like a it was a jacket, but it was. Uh, like a hoodie, but it didn't have, it, the sleeves were large. It just looked like the most comfortable thing ever. I said, I said, I, you know, I can't bring anything back. I said, that jacket you were in, that thing, that clothing you have is amazing. He said, do you want this? He said, I'll give it to you. I'm like, that's not going to work. I'm in a dream. I'm like, I don't know how it is on your realm. I'm like, but I'm in a dream state. I can't bring things back with me. He said, no, it's going to be yours. You'll have it. It'll be yours. I woke up, it wasn't there. That would have really freaked me. Oh, I think I would have checked myself into a clinic. If that, that would have been too much for me to handle. But six years later, I found that jacket in Oregon visiting my family. I found it in a shop, and I'm like, I, it, so from everybody else's perspective, I was shopping in a store, and I came across that jacket, and I mean, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I'm like, I was brought to tears, and I'm like, this is my jacket. And they're like, what is wrong with you? What's it's like? I mean, I was having this emotional experience. So 
Yeah, I bought it. You know, I still had to pay for it, which didn't seem right. Like, you know, should have had that handed to me. But I have that jacket now. That's really cool. Yeah, he didn't say how. He didn't say. He didn't say. He didn't say exactly. You're right. Just, it's going to be yours. I said, okay. If you say so. Who, yeah. it, it, who do you um, who do you follow currently, and who is your inspiration? So when I started looking into this, I essentially the people I started following are the people that broke stuff down into more simplistic terms. I was starting with the people who were really <coughs> complex, going into all of the different aspects of you know, meditation, different meditation rituals, and rituals in general and astral projection and crystals and incense I and mean, I studied all of it you know everything that I could get my hands on and now more so I would say that the people that make sense to me are the speakers who are they have such a simplistic way of looking at things uh, Eckhart uh, Tolle uh, Tolle for okay. Tolle, Tolle yeah I'm not sure how it pronounces that Tolle. when I read the power of now I'm just like that's so simple that is such a that is it's perfect. He doesn't describe, of course, all of the things that I'm talking about, but in my, in, my, uh, in my opinion, you don't have to. If you learn how to get into the present moment, you will have access to all that stuff. You, know, you, don't, you, know, you don't need the specific instruction after that. It's all about learning how to get back into your center, and I think that he's one of those speakers who does just a wonderful job of describing what eloquently what the now is, what it means to us, and how we can tap back into it. So that's one example, but like I said, mostly what I read now is uh, I read a lot of physics more so. Physics, what kind of physics? Theoretical? Uh, a lot of theoretical physics, uh, nothing that's too off the wall, but I also like to educate myself on just just standard, yeah, cosmology and just uh, standard physics in general. And not the math, I, I'm reading these, I'm reading the people who are able to take that, those higher concepts and all the math and the equations and break it down into a, so an, you know, an idiot, idiot like me can understand it. So it's the people who are good at that. And there's not a lot of people who are able to do that. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, is very good at bringing information down to, you know, down to people's levels that make sense. Uh, Brian Green. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist who talks about all this, all this kind of stuff. In fact, in my videos, when I'm talking about weird stuff like time travel, I'll reference and I'll show videos from Brian Greene. I'm like, it's not that crazy. If you think of it from the perspective of, we, if we stop thinking of the future as something that's way somewhere else, if we start understanding why it's all in one nutshell at the time, at the same time in the moment. Because, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do we bring this, all that information that you're sharing, yeah. to the present, to the right now, so we can incorporate into our current reality that it will help us yeah. on our what's evolution the, what's path? The like, what's the most practical thing? Is, what, is what's that, what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, what do I do tomorrow? <clears throat> okay. to me, what can I do next week? Right. To me, in my opinion, I would say it start with meditation. That's really what it comes to. I, I think that a daily meditation, even if it's for five minutes. If you find five minutes a day and you can really be quiet and truly drop, put the phone away, truly just tell yourself for the next five minutes, I'm off duty. I'm off duty for the next five minutes. I'm not going to think about my finances. I'm not going to think about that problem I'm dealing with. For five, if you can do that for five minutes, that is, God, start there. That's the most powerful thing you can do, in my opinion. And everything else will start, it'll lead off and it'll branch off of that. All the rest of the, the waking up, you know, it, starts, it starts there. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. So med I say meditation. The rest, yeah, if you, can, if you want to start incorporating, trying to get into lucid dream states, there's a lot of, a lot of people, including myself, who will start, you know, who, who've talked about this, how to, how to start those practices, how to start training yourself. But you've got to learn. I think you've got to start. It starts with meditating. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I think it's cooled down to 85. So yeah, because I, I have changed the temperature. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys for staying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.